بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We are in the Kitab al-Nikah in Sahih Muslim and this next chapter is about rules pertaining to the Muhrim the one who is in the state of Ihram during the Hajj or the Umrah Nubayh ibn Wahab reports that Umar ibn Ubaidullah intended to marry Talha ibn Umar with the daughter of Shayba ibn Jubair so he sent a messenger to Aban ibn Uthman to attend the wedding ceremony at that time, Aban ibn Uthman was the leader of the Hajj delegation and he said that I heard Uthman ibn Affan say that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said لا ينكح المحرم ولا ينكح ولا يخطب that a Muhrim must neither marry nor be given in marriage nor should he make a marriage proposal to somebody we find that Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Qur'an about the one who wants to perform the Hajj فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ So whoever makes the Hajj obligatory in these months then there must be no Rafath and Rafath means sexual intercourse and that which leads to it so foreplay and the like and it is for this reason that the Prophet has forbidden anyone to get married even in the stage of ihram because this leads to conjugal relations and you're not allowed to arrange the marriage for anyone that is to give somebody else in marriage some words say yunkahu which means to be given in marriage so that the muhrim cannot be given in marriage and other words say yunkihu that is to give somebody else in marriage so let's say to give your daughter in marriage so a muhrim is not allowed to marry even somebody who is not in the state of ihram and what about if a man who is muhill so not in the state of ihram wants to marry a muhilla a woman not in the state of ihram but her wali is muhrim in the state of ihram is this permissible well according to the generality of the hadith this is not permissible because in order for such a marriage to take place the wali of the woman would have to give his daughter in marriage of course but the wali is in the state of ihram even if the other two parties are not so this marriage is impermissible one may argue here that there is no danger for the muhrim in this case to have a sexual intercourse because he is not the one who is going to be in this marriage contract the two parties in the marriage contract are both muhil and this seems like a genuine objection however the generality of the wording is to be followed and then besides the bride and the bridegroom can easily wait until after the wali exits ihram okay so now that we have established this ruling we ask the next question when does this prohibition end well according to most scholars this prohibition ends after the second exiting of the ihram not the first the first exiting of the ihram is when you complete two of the three following acts stoning the Jamrat al aqaba on the 10th shaving off the head and the tawaf al ifada these three any two of these three would have you exit the ihram the first exiting then when you've completed all three of them and when we say all three that would include the sa'i after the tawaf al ifada if you have not already done so so if you have done all of that then you have exited the second exiting of the ihram in which case everything becomes halal for you after the first exiting everything becomes halal for you except for women as the prophet والسلام, told us what about a case where a muhrim enters a marriage contract or gives somebody else in marriage when he is in the state of ihram before the second tahallul well the marriage contract is invalid and must be conducted again because this act is forbidden in and of itself and any act which is forbidden in and of itself then if you perform it then its presence is like its absence that is to say it is fasid or badl if you like which means that its effects do not follow or do not result as a consequence so in a marriage contract that would be to say that this man and a woman are not husband and wife one might argue back here and say what about al dhihar when a man likens his wife to the back of his mother that is to say he is not allowed to have intercourse with her because of course your mother is haram for you now that is forbidden you're not allowed to do that however its effects do follow which is why you have to offer the kafara it's not like its presence is like its absence so the answer to this is that vihar 
only happens as a prohibited act. It is not possible for a vihar ever to be a permitted act, whereas with a marriage contract it is possible for it to be permissible and impermissible. So it can be sahih or fasid, whereas a vihar is always ever fasid and of course haram. Just like zina, for example. Zina can never ever be sahih or a valid act. It is always a fasid act and haram, but the punishment does follow for zina and likewise for the dhihar, the punishment will follow, but of course the kafara will save you from the punishment. And that's why there is this kafara. So as for those actions which could be sahih or fasid, then if they are performed in a fasid state, then their presence is like their absence. So this rule of ours or this principle does not apply to al-dhihar because al-dhihar is only ever haram. Also in the chapter we find a narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu who says that the Prophet married Maymuna when he was a muhrim. And we also have another narration from Maymuna herself who says that the Prophet married her whilst in a state of ihlal. So he was not a muhrim. Maymuna, of course, was the maternal aunt of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So clearly we have a conflict between the two narrations and it should be clear whose narration we should take. We should take Maymuna's narration because she is the person or the main person in the actual episode here. She ought to know how the Prophet married her. She was the one being married, not Ibn Abbas. On top of that, we have a narration from Rafi ibn Khadij who also says that the Prophet married Maymuna when he was not Muhrim. And Rafi ibn Khadij says that he was the messenger between both of them. So again, he ought to know. Therefore, the conclusion we would draw from this is that Ibn Abbas simply has made a mistake. And this can happen to anyone, of course. We are led to believe a certain idea. And yet, the reality is that we were wrongly led to believe in that. Or perhaps sometimes we make an assumption and our assumption is wrong. Now we move to the next chapter, which talks about the prohibition of forwarding a marriage proposal against the proposal of your brother until he permits you to do so or leaves off pursuing his own proposal. From Ibn Umar radiallahu an that the Prophet والسلام, said لا يبع بعضكم على بيع بعض ولا يخطب بعضكم على خطبة بعض that you people should not sell against each other and you should not propose against each other in marriage that is. Also in another wording the Prophet والسلام, said لا يبع الرجل على بيع أخيه ولا يخطب على خطبة أخيه إلا أن يأذن له that a man should not sell against the sale of his brother and he should not propose in marriage against the proposition of his brother unless he permits him. So this idea of selling against the sale of your brother let us say that a person sells a car to another for a thousand pounds and then thereafter you go to the buyer and say that I can sell you a better car for the same price or perhaps I can sell you a similar car for a lower price so that the buyer will buy from you. Now if you did this in the Muddatul Khiyar in the time period in which the buyer has a choice to go along with the contract or to annul it so for example he wants to let's say have one week to test drive the car after which he will finalize the sale. So this Muddatul Khiyar, the period of choice is now in our case one week. So within this week the buyer can annul the contract or go ahead with it and he has the choice because they both agreed to it. Now in this particular time period if you were to go to the buyer and say that I can sell you a similar car for cheaper or perhaps for the same price give you a better car then this is impermissible to do so because you would be in effect stealing the sale away from the first vendor and that is an act of transgression against him. And likewise in the Khiyar al-Majlis, you're not allowed to sell against the sale of your brother. Khiyar al-Majlis, of course, is that both have the right to annul the contract as long as they have not left each other's company. And company is determined by the customs. And the reason why it is haram in the Khiyar al-Majlis and the Khiyar al-Shart is clear enough because if you offer him a better deal, he's going to annul the first contract and that's a transgression against the first seller. However, more interesting question is what about after the period of choice? Because 
Some ulama say that after the period of the choice, khayar al-majlis or the khayar al-shart, you're not allowed to annul the contract. So even if you now offered him a better deal, he would not be able to annul the first contract and hence there will be no transgression against the first seller. However, it is not as simple as that. Because even after the khayar al-majlis, if you offered him a better deal, how would that make the buyer feel? It will make the buyer feel that the first seller, the first vendor, has taken advantage of him. Perhaps he's been cheated or duped by the first seller, in that he paid a higher price than what he would have paid with the second seller. So it's going to create a feeling of anger, hatred, but also regret as well. Oh, why did I buy from the first seller? I should have waited and bought from the second seller. And this is a major problem. There is a possible second problem in that he may try to annul the first contract. Perhaps he will fake a defect in the item, or perhaps some other means in which he tries to annul the first contract. And again, that is possible and a major problem. So we say that even afterwards, you should not offer him a better deal. And you see this happening all the time, of course. Person asks, where did you buy this from? And he says, I bought this item from such and such a place. Oh, okay. And how much did you buy it for? I bought it for such and such a price. He says, oh, you should have come to me. I would have given you a much better deal. Or perhaps you should have gone here or there to buy it. You would have got a much better deal. All of this is simply going to produce feelings of regret in the buyer and even hatred towards the first seller. And what is funny here is that this person giving the advice to the buyer thinks he's doing a favor to the buyer by letting him know of a better deal. Well, he's not doing him a favor. Doing people a favor is when you do good to them. But making him regret his decision and perhaps sowing anger in him against the first seller, is that doing good to him? And remember, like we said before, the word used in the hadith is akhi, his brother, but this also includes a non-Muslim, which is a dhimmi, a musta'man or a mu'ahad, because their wealth and life is also to be respected. In another narration of the same chapter from Abu Hurairah, he says the Prophet forbade that a city dweller should sell on behalf of a Bedouin, so the one who lives outside the city. The reason for this is because the city dweller is well acquainted with the price of this particular item, so he'll be able to haggle a lot better than the Bedouin. The Bedouin is a lot more likely to sell this item at a lower price, whereas the city dweller would be better at haggling and he will sell the item at a higher price. So that means that the rest of the people would be disadvantaged if they are buying from a fellow city dweller. And the Prophet ﷺ authentically said, nas min ba'd. Leave the people alone, Allah will provide to some of these people from others. One might ask at this point, if we allow this ruling, then will it not be the case that people will just dupe the Bedouin and buy his item for a lot less than what it ought to be sold for? The answer is no. The rights of the Bedouin will be protected because, first of all, the Bedouin will look for the best price. If somebody is completely ripping off the Bedouin by offering him a very low price, then there is going to be someone else who will offer a better price. And then let us suppose he does get ripped off and somebody buys his item for a very low price, an unfairly low price. Well, the Prophet ﷺ informed us in another authentic hadith that you should not go out of the city to meet the incoming trade caravans to buy from them because in a case like this, you're likely to buy it from a lot less because the trade caravans do not know the going price in the market as they are outside the city at the moment. But the Prophet said, whoever buys from them and then the owner of the merchandise comes into the city and finds out that he's been duped, then the Prophet said that he has a choice whether to annul the contract or to go ahead with it. Now, an interesting point is that what is apparent from this hadith is that the Hadir, the city dweller, cannot act as a broker for the Badi, the Bedouin. So that is to say that even if the Bedouin comes to the city dweller and asks him to sell the item on his behalf, the generality of the hadith tells us that this is impermissible. Yes, if the city dweller made an advance 
on the Bedouin and asked him to sell his item for him, then this is impermissible and that is clear from the hadith. But what we are talking about is the other way around. The Bedouin makes an advance on the city dweller and wants the city dweller to act as a broker for him, so a wakil in other words. The generality of the hadith says it is impermissible, but on the other hand, we can argue that the Bedouin is a free person, he can trade with his goods, and if that is the case, then we know you're allowed to appoint a wakil to trade on your behalf. So why can't he do that? Now this second opinion seems like the weightier one, and it is what the people practice nowadays. And what indicates to that is, in another wording, the Prophet said, nas min ba'd. Leave the people alone, Allah will provide to some from others. So it has this idea of the city dweller almost harassing the Bedouin to sell on his behalf. Whereas in our case, it is the Bedouin who offers the job to the city dweller. In the same narration of Abu Huraira, the Prophet forbade a najash. This is when you offer a higher price for the product, not with the intention of buying it, but rather with the intention of harming the other buyer. Because of course the seller is going to sell to the highest bidder. Or it could be with the intention of just benefiting the seller, so that the seller gets to sell it at a higher price. Because then the other buyer is going to try to outbid you. Because it could be that the seller and the one committing the najish are working in cahoots and that they will both benefit from the higher price. So it is vital to know that the najish has the intention of either harming the buyer or benefiting the seller. Maybe because you're the seller's friend or maybe you're going to share the price. But if somebody increases the price because he wants to increase the price, he wants the product, but then thereafter he changes his mind and does not want the product anymore. Is this najish? The answer is no, because the intention is different. And so from this narration and this ruling, we find that the Sharia is concerned with preserving people's rights. We take the right lesson from this hadith that Islam is not just about ritualistic acts of worship, but rather it does concern itself with the rights of other people. And in particular, that brothers should not transgress each other. And it removes any feeling of enmity and hatred from the hearts of the people. Let us move to the next chapter which is the tahrim or the prohibition of the nikah type called the shigar from Ibn Umar that the Prophet ﷺ forbade the shigar and he goes on to explain what this is he says that a shigar is that a man marries off his daughter to another man on the condition that that other man would marry his daughter to him and there is no sadaq or mahar between them the word shigar comes from shagar of a place which means that it is empty because this contract is empty of the mahar. So in the case where each man marry off their own daughters to the other man and there is no sadaq between them, this is shigar and that's what's been explained in the narration. But what about if this does happen, however, there is mahar between them. So in other words, each of the two daughters do receive their mahar. There is no doubt that the mahar must be given, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَأُحِلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكُمْ أَنْ تَبْتَغُوا بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ And anything besides these types of women who are prohibited are halal for you, that you should seek them with your wealth, meaning to give them the mahar. But what about this shigar, quote-unquote, without the mahar? So the mahar is the right of the wife. So could we have this scenario then, where each of the two men marries off his own daughter to the other and there is a mahar between them, so each daughter receives the mahar? From the ulama are those who say that if the mahar is given to each of the women in accordance with what should be given to her, meaning a woman of her status, and the husband are a fitting match for her, they are equal in status to her, and the women are happy with this, then such a contract is okay. Other scholars say no, even this is impermissible because what's happening here is that the man is marrying his daughter for his own interest because he's going to get to marry this other woman who is the, of course, daughter of the other man. And so the problem with this is that we have a loss of amana. Remember the wali of a woman is an amin. He must act in the interest of the woman. 
not in his own personal interest. That's part of his amana. So those scholars who say it is haram mutlaqan, whether there is a mahar or not, it is an understandable opinion in that they're trying to block off the doors that will lead to treachery on the part of the wali, that he acts only for his own self-desire. And other scholars who hold the opinion that it, this is valid, their opinion is also understandable because as long as the mahar is given and the husband is a fitting match for the wife so that the wife is not being taken advantage of, then there does not appear to be too many problems. Let's move to the next chapter, which is about fulfilling the conditions in a nikah contract. From Uqba ibn Amir, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna ahaq al-sharti an yufa bihi mastahlaltum bihi al-furuj And in another wording, Inna ahaq al-shurut The hadith means that the most worthy condition for you to fulfill or to be fulfilled is that by which you make the private parts halal for yourself. That is to say, those conditions by which you make sexual intercourse halal for yourself. In a marriage contract, you're allowed to make conditions, such as the woman can make a condition that you will live in a separate house, separate to your mother, because maybe she does not want to live with the mother-in-law. Or perhaps they will say that you will not travel to another country. Or perhaps she might want an increase in the mahar. There are many different conditions that can be made as long as they are acceptable in the Sharia because the Prophet ﷺ said كُلُّ شَرْطٍ لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ بَاطِلٍ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِئَةُ شَرْطٍ Every condition not in the book of Allah, meaning not in accordance with the Sharia of Allah, then it is batil, it is null and void, even if there were a hundred conditions. Likewise, الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَى شُرُوطِهِمْ إِلَّا شَرْطًا أَحَلَّ حَرَامًا أَوْ حَرَّمَ حَلَالًا the Muslims are bound by their conditions which they make, as long as the condition does not make the haram into halal nor the halal into haram. And an example of an invalid condition is something which we have discussed when a woman says, yes, I'll marry you on the condition that you divorce your first wife. That is a condition which is not in the Kitab of Allah, meaning it is contradictory to the Sharia of Allah Jalla wa ala. Hence, it is not to be respected. And we spoke about the ruling, does the woman now have the right to annul the marriage contract if the husband does not respect this facet condition? The asal with the conditions you make is that they are valid. So if anyone says that this is an invalid condition, then upon him is the evidence. And the condition by which you make sexual intercourse halal for yourself has to be the most worthy condition to follow because otherwise having conjugal relations with this wife would be a major sin. So if you think about it, this is a great jump. Normally, this conjugal relation would be a major sin, it would be zina. But now you're transforming it into something which is not just halal, but rather it is reward worthy. And so with this major transition, it goes to follow that any conditions you put to make this haram into halal most certainly would have to be fulfilled. Let us move to the next chapter about seeking the consent of a woman for marriage. From Abu Huraira, that the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تنكح الأيم حتى تستأمر ولا تنكح البكر حتى تستأذن قالوا يا رسول الله وكيف إذنها قال أن تسكت The Prophet said that a divorced woman or a widowed woman, so a woman who's previously been married, she is not to be married unless her order is taken, so unless she has been consulted, and a virgin that is a girl who has not been married, should not be married until she gives her permission. They asked her, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what is her permission or how is it to be sought? And he said that merely she keeps quiet. The word ayyim means the one who does not have a husband. But the one who does not have a husband could be one who's never been married before or one who has been married before. But in this context, it means the one who has been married before but has lost the husband either through death or divorce. And her consultation must be sought, so it's not enough that she just keeps quiet. She must actually give a verbal input. As for the virgin, then it is enough that she keeps quiet. That will be her consent. If she is not happy with the suitor, then she can say that I am not happy. The Prophet said that she keeps quiet, and this is because, certainly in those times, this would normally be the case, that the virgin girl would be shy and hence would not speak about these matters. It is true that times have changed and you're hardly likely to get someone who will keep quiet. 
Hence, if she speaks and gives a verbal approval, then this is also fine. So in either case, the husband must be fully described to the woman. Of course, they're allowed to see each other, not in private, of course, but they are allowed to see each other. And the minimum threshold is that the husband must be fully described to the woman. So how he looks like and who he is, his job, his earning, that sort of thing. What's funny is that if we take the Zahiriya approach, then if the virgin girl speaks and give her verbal consent, then this is not seen as her permission. Why? Because the Prophet said that she needs to keep silent, and in this case, she did not keep silent, and therefore, she did not give her consent. Even if she shouted out, yes, this is the husband I want, this is the man I want to marry. And so this is what happens when you take an evidence completely on its zahir value. It's a good methodology to take the evidence on its zahir meaning. There's no doubt about that. But what type of zahir or apparent meaning are we looking at here? Because if you go to extremes, then you end up holding the opinion of the zahiriya on this particular mas'ala. But if we say that the zahir is simply that she should give her permission, however this is given, and that this would be enough, and the Prophet simply said that she keeps quiet, because this is what was ghalib, what was most commonly the case. So they say, kharaja makhrij al ghalib. It came out of the most common exit. Otherwise, what's important is that her permission should be given and that she should be happy. A similar scenario in which the Zahiriya make a peculiar mistake is that when the Prophet ﷺ said that you're allowed to only sacrifice a musinna, those, the animal with the front tooth showing in the Eid al-Adha, except if you cannot find one, then in that case you can sacrifice a six-month-old sheep well, in that case, they say, the Zahiriya, that you're not allowed to sacrifice a one-year-old Dha'an, which is a sheep, because the textual evidence from Sahih Muslim says specifically a Jadha, which is a six-month-old sheep. It does not say a one-year-old sheep. But this is funny because if you're allowed to sacrifice a six-month-old sheep, then you should a fortiori be allowed to sacrifice a one-year-old sheep, because that will be more worthy. But this is what happens when you take an extreme Zahiriya approach. Now, upon this, someone might say, but Abu Bakr radiallahu an, married off Aisha when she was six years old, and her consent was not sought. Well, clearly, her consent was not sought. However, this is a unique situation, and the reason why is because the whole point about seeking consent is that you do not marry off this girl to someone she does not want to be married to. However, this does not apply to the Prophet ﷺ. It cannot be envisaged that any woman or girl would not want to be married to the Prophet, or that perhaps she would refuse marriage to the Prophet. Hence here, the analogy cannot be made. First of all, the suitor, in normal everyday cases, cannot be analogous to the Prophet, and the wali of the woman, in everyday cases, cannot be analogous to Abu Bakr Also, from the chapter, from Ibn Abbas, the Prophet ﷺ said, That the Thayyib, a woman who has been previously married, has more right about herself than her wali, and a virgin's father must ask her consent from her, her consent being her silence. This hadith means that the Thayyib, a woman who has been previously married, can verbally give her own consent, her wali does not need to give her consent on her behalf to the suitor. She can speak for herself. The reason is obvious because she's been married before. She has experience. She knows about men. And she can definitely now speak for her own self. Whereas a virgin girl is going to be shy and inexperienced. And hence the wali would speak for her. It is vital to point out what this hadith does not mean. It does not mean, as some scholars have said, that the Thayyib, a woman previously married, can get married without her wali. No, this is not what the hadith means. Rather, it means what we have said. The difference between isti'adhan and isti'mar is that with isti'adhan, it is seeking permission. So he says, I will marry to such and such a man with such and such a description and so on. Do you agree? And if she keeps silence, she says, then that is the approval. 
But as with the isti'mar, it's more of a consultation, seeking not just her permission, but her opinion on matters. What type of person is she looking for? And so on. So it's much more of a consultation rather than just a do you agree, yes or no type of scenario. So that's the difference between isti'dhan and isti'mar. And these hadith also prove to us that a man cannot force his daughter into marriage, no matter what her age is. It's just that some scholars did say that a man can force her young daughter into marriage, but then after that, when she grows up, she has the right to annul the marriage contract. But we say no, her permission must always be sought. Let's move to the next chapter, the chapter of the father giving away his young virgin daughter in marriage. This is a long narration from Aisha radiallahu anha. Let us give the translation. She says the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, married me at the age of six and he consummated marriage when I was nine. She says, we went to Medina and I had a fever for a month and my hair became as long as my earlobes. She said, Umm Ruman, who was her mother, came to me and I was at that time, she says, on a swing along with my playmates. She said, she called me loudly. I went to her. I did not know what she wanted of me. She says, she took hold of my hand and took me to the door and I was saying, ha, ha as if I was gasping for air, until the agitation in my heart was over. She took me to a house where women of the Ansar had gathered. They all blessed me, she says, and wished me good fortune, and they said the best fortune and blessing. So in Arabic that is, ala khayri wal baraka, wa ala khayri ta'ir. And she says that my mother, Umm Ruman, entrusted me to them, she says, they washed my head and embellished me, and nothing frightened me. Allah's Messenger والسلام, came there in the morning, and I was entrusted to him. There is another narration in which he says that he married her when she was seven, took her in as a bride when she was nine, and he passed away from her when she was 18 years old. We have another narration which says that she had her toys with her. So that proves the permissibility of playing with toys for kids. And even these dolls, which look like human, they do not come under the category of imitating the creation of Allah, like the Musawwirun, those who make images, come under. Because this is a special exception for children. And we know that Aisha, she had a horse with wings on it. Now a horse definitely is a living creature, it would be an imitation of the creation of Allah. But we can make exceptions for children's toys and books and things of that nature, both educational resources and entertainment ones. We also take from the hadith that you don't have to consummate the marriage immediately after the nikah contract and that it can actually wait. The narration which says that she was seven years old is shav because it contradicts the ones that say she was six years old and that's the one we're going to take. The main question from these narrations is that is it permissible to give a young daughter in marriage? Well the point is that a young girl would have no consent because she will not know anything about marriage. Marrying off young girls was normal in those days. They would marry off orphan girls and orphans as we know by definition are those children without a father who have not reached puberty yet. So clearly they are minors as they have not reached adolescence. The evidence for this in Surah An-Nisa Allah Jalla wa Ala says Ayah 127 وَمَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْكِتَابِ فِي يَتَامَ النِّسَاءِ اللَّاتِ لَا تُؤْتُونَهُنَّ مَا كُتِبَ لَهُنَّ وَتَرْغَبُونَ أَن تَنْكِحُوهُنَّ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الْوِلْدَانِ وَأَن تَقُومُوا لِلْيَتَامَى بِالْقِسْطِ وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِهِ عَلِيمًا They ask you for a verdict about women. Say Allah instructs you about them and about what is recited to you in the book concerning the orphan girls. These have to be below the age of puberty. Of course, because that's what orphan is, whom you give not the prescribed portions, that is the mahr, and yet you desire to marry them. So Allah Jalla wa is saying, you do not give them their desired mahr, what is appropriate for them, yet you want to marry them. So we find that it was quite normal that the people would want to marry young girls at that time, it was seen to be normal. Although Islam does not lay 
down a minimum age of marriage, it leaves it down to the customs of the people. But there is evidence, however, to suggest to us that puberty is seen to be the normal minimum age of marriage. The evidence for this earlier on in Surah An-Nisa. Ayah number six. وَبَتَلُوا الْيَتَامَ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحَ فَإِنْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْدًا فَدَفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Al-Ayah. And try or test the orphans until they reach the nikah, that is, the age of marriage. And then if you find in them sound judgment, then release their wealth to them. Now what is known is that you are the guardian of the orphan, you protect their wealth. When they reach adulthood or puberty and can look after their own wealth, as long as they have sound judgment, then you give them their wealth. That is at the age of puberty because they are no longer orphans anymore. But notice here that the ayah says, until when they reach nikah, that is the age of marriage. So that means to say that the age of puberty is the age of marriage. And the wajhud dilala is clear cut as you can see. And it also needs to be noted that the Prophet ﷺ in his culture and customs did nothing wrong with this marriage. Because if it had been wrong, then the mushrikun would have made a big song and dance about it. Yet they did not. And what proves that they would have made a big song and dance about it, and that the Prophet would have hesitated in this marriage, is his marriage with Zainab bint Jahsh, who was the divorced wife of Zayd ibn Haritha. Now Zayd ibn Haritha was the adopted son of the Prophet. At that time adoption was allowed, it was later made haram of course, but at that time he was the adopted son of the Prophet. And the culture or the customs in those days was that you are not allowed to marry the divorced wife of your adopted son. This was seen as something extremely horrible. Yet, this is what the Prophet was instructed to do. And the Prophet feared the public outrage. And Allah Jalla wa ala admonished him. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 37, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله وتخفي في نفسك ما الله مبديه وتخشى الناس والله أحق أن تخشى فلما قضى زيد منها وطرا زوجناكها لكي لا يكون على المؤمنين حرج في أزواج أطيعائهم إذا قضوا منهن وطرا وكان أمر الله مفعولا and when you said to the one on whom Allah has bestowed grace, and you have bestowed grace, speaking about Zayd ibn Haritha, you said, keep your wife and fear Allah. You were hiding in yourself what Allah was going to make apparent, O Muhammad And you feared the people, yet Allah is more worthy to be feared. And when Zayd completed his desire from her, we married her to you, meaning Zainab bint Jahsh so that there would be no hesitation in the hearts of the mu'mineen concerning the wives of their adopted sons, when their adopted sons do not have any need for these wives anymore, and the command of Allah must be fulfilled. So actually, the controversial marriage was not his marriage with Aisha, rather it was his marriage with Zainab bint Jahsh. This is the marriage which provoked a public outcry. Yet nowadays, it would be the other way around. There would be no public outcry if a man marries the divorced wife of his adopted son. Nobody would even think twice about it. Yet it was a big issue back then. So even though there is no lower age limit in the Sharia for someone to get married, common sense and decency needs to be applied. Just an appropriate age needs to be laid down from culture to culture and people to people. And this is something that the Sharia leaves down to the people. It leaves it open. It will not take a heavy-handed approach and say 15 is the minimum age or 16 or 17 or 18 because this greatly varies from people to people and culture to culture. Now it should be noted that what Imam Ahmed says is that the father specifically and only the father is allowed to give the prepubescent daughter in marriage but no one else from the wali is allowed to do that and this is likely to happen for a genuine need for example, the father is looking for someone suitable to look after his daughter, especially considering that men can easily die in wars, and especially in those days, the life expectancy was lower. Let's pick up a few more points of benefit. If a man proposes against the proposal of his brother, is this marriage contract valid? Some scholars say that this marriage contract is invalid, and others say it is valid. 
Definitely what he has done is haram in terms of proposing, but there is a difference between the proposal and the actual marriage contract. You could argue that the contract itself is sahih, even if the proposal was haram, and that does appear to be a more rational view. If the first suitor who proposed allows the second suitor, does this mean that a third suitor is now also allowed to propose? Or does the permission only apply to the second suitor? This is an interesting question. It appears that if the first suitor allows the second one, then he has lost interest in the marriage proposal. If that is the case, then we would say that even a third suitor would be allowed to propose. You could make a case by saying that if we know he has only allowed the second suitor, but no one else, then no one else is allowed to propose until they seek the permission. But the matter is a nice debate. Also, we need to know that Bikr means virgin and Thayyib means non-virgin, even if she is non-virgin by way of fornication, and that no one is allowed to force a non-virgin into a marriage contract regardless of her age. As for the virgin, then if she is Baligha, then you are not allowed to force anyone. But if she is pre-pubescent, meaning before Baligha, then as we have said, the father is allowed to marry her without her particular consent. And this would be for a particular need. And it's restricted to the father alone. Okay, but what about the age of conjugal relations, that is the sexual intercourse? That is different to the actual contract itself. What we say that, again, the Sharia does not stipulate any particular age, rather it is down to the customs. The Prophet consummated marriage with Aisha when she was nine years old, so clearly she was able to undertake such an act at that age. So the people will just exercise their judgment on this matter. Okay, let's take some review questions at this stage. Can a Muslim propose against the proposal of a Dhimmi Christian who is proposing marriage to a Christian woman? Explain your answer. Question number two. Explain what the Shigar marriage contract is and why it is impermissible. Question number three. How is an appropriate marriage age to be determined according to the Sharia? Ah.